today what I want to talk about is the Four Noble Truths. Now we all know that the Four Noble Truths have uh, been always thought about as being the summary of Buddhism. So most of us who have uh, um, approached Buddhism have heard this at the front door. The basic Four Noble Truths are there is suffering, there is a cause of suffering, there is a cessation of suffering, and there is a path to the cessation of suffering. Now, over the past, I've talked about uh, the bhavana or the practice that people use in order to see and understand the Four Noble Truths. But for the lay people who are interested in what Buddhism can do for you in everyday life, there are some important factors about the Four Noble Truths that we can talk about. The Four Noble Truths can be presented in four different ways. The first way that we can present the Four Noble Truths is just what we've done as a brief summary of what the teaching of the Buddha was when he talked about there is suffering and he was interested in finding out what the nature of that suffering was. It's kind of like taking a sieve in the kitchen uh, when we are cooking and shaking down in the sieve to the very finest point what exactly suffering was. If we had one word to say what suffering was about, we would probably go to what the late ven most venerable K. Sri Dhammananda called unsatisfactoriness. Unsatisfactoriness means uh, I like something and I want to make it stay here as long as I can, or I don't like the way something is and I want to make it stop. It's as simple as that. So this is causing us an unsatisfactoriness because of one of the characteristics of existence. The characteristics were the impermanence and this suffering and anatta, which is the idea of the impersonal nature of everything. Anatta was previously, uh, has been translated as meaning no self in English, but that doesn't exactly catch the problem of anatta. The word anatta uh, means without the identity, without the personalization. And personalization, the word personal is the root word, and it means taking things personally. So atta would be taking things personally, and anatta would be realizing the impersonal nature of everything that is happening in our experience of this existence. So this first noble truth, the Buddha was interested in figuring out exactly what the nature of this suffering was first. And in the texts, he uses the expression in many of the suttas, which were the discourses that he taught. And these are called, uh, the word sutta actually means thread. And we've been talking the last uh, couple of days about how we are um, reweaving, attempting to reweave the Dhamma cloth or to uh, find the tapestry of truth. And if we're doing that, we have to remember that one thread is not a cloth. So he was trying, the Buddha was trying to uh, show us all the threads that made up the Dhamma cloth and connected it together. And this is what we're talking about in these talks. So the suffering is basically my personal dissatisfactoriness with the way things are, my struggle to make them the way uh, I want them to be. So once again, we can see all of the tension and the tightness in the mind and in the body causing us the trouble with our suffering. The second one of the noble truths was that there, there is a cause of suffering. We just talked a little bit about our discontentment with this suffering, and what the Buddha called this was craving. And craving has a symptom and the symptom of craving is that it always manifests. 
it always comes up as tension and tightness in the body and in the mind. And so when we talk about our practice, the way we were yesterday talking about our practice, we are talking about the unwholesome tendency for the mind and the unwholesome tendency of the body has tension and it has tightness in it. And I think we may have talked about the fact that tension is the seed to the modern day stress disorder and the stress disorder is the seed for the unhealthy uh, stress-related dis diseases of mind, the mental uh, disorders of uh, depression, anxiety, panic attack, and all of these things. So when there's tension and tightness in your mind and in your body, then what happens is we have dis-ease in the mind and in the body. So this, this craving that the Buddha talked about is, is the uh, always manifests as tension and tightness as it's arising. And it has this symptom of this tension and tightness, which you and I can learn to see and understand when we are doing our meditation. And then it also is known as the I like it, I want it, the attachment in the mind, or the I don't like it, I don't want it, and the aversion in the mind. You can see this attachment or this aversion, both of them have a tension and a tightness in them. So that's what we want to learn to let go of so that our mind can open and our mind can see clearly this arising tension and tightness. The third one of the noble truth, the third one, is there is a cessation of the, this suffering. And the cessation of the suffering is easy to understand here because if we say that the suffering is uh, the stress and the tension and tightness, then we can see that the, the uh, cessation of the suffering is the cessation of this tension and tightness. So we're getting down to the very core structure of what the problem was for the Buddha, and he's looking at this, and he's going to experiment with this to see if he can establish a path to the cessation of suffering. And this is the fourth noble truth. The fourth noble truth is the path, there is a path to the cessation of suffering. And this path is composed of eight folds. We call this the noble eight-fold path. It has eight folds. It's kind of like if I opened up a fan, okay, if I opened up a fan like this and it had eight folds in the fan, eight folds, these folds would compose the path to reach this cessation of suffering. So we don't want to eliminate those at all or change it uh, in any way. We want to understand that all eight of those folds are important to simultaneously work together within our meditation structure. So this was the first way of looking at the teaching and remembering that it is an outline for the uh, basic Buddhist teachings. Now the second way that we look at the Four Noble Truths, we can look at it uh, and examine it and see that the Buddha actually was using this as his personal pattern of investigation. Now, what, what do I mean by a pattern of investigation? Well, uh, we've heard of uh, the dependent origination that they talk about, or dependent arising that occurs within the uh, teachings, the Buddhist teachings. And what we need to do is we need to look at how exactly was he able to uh, examine this and he had a personal way of investigating, which is described in the Samyutta Nikaya, in the Nidanawaga, which is called the Book of Causation. And in that book, uh, it tells us that there is an origination and there is a cessation of these parts of dependent arising or dependent origination. 
Now, when the Buddha was looking into examining these pieces, this was before he was enlightened. He starts out, um, monks, when I was just a bodhis bodhisattva, before I was enlightened, it, I looked upon the world and I saw that everything was full of suffering. And at that point, I wondered why this was happening. This is how he starts out when he talks about the origination. And then he starts with aging and death, uh, which is the aging and death and the sorrow, the lamentation, the pain, the grief and despair of the suffering. And he starts to look at that and he says, now, this is the problem. Okay, what was the cause? And he looked at the cause of this and he found that the cause of this was birth. And then that point, then the person is faced with the aging process and all the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair that occurs in each one of the events of our life. And we're going to talk more about that a little bit later in another talk, about precisely how does the sorrow, the lamentation, the pain, the grief, and despair happen? And how can we let go of that in daily life? We may not be able to become an arahat in this lifetime, which is a fully realized being that is uh, never going to be reborn. We may not be able to become an anagami, which is the next level, but we can get a full understanding of how the teachings work, and we can start applying this to our life in this very lifetime. And we can reduce the amount of suffering. One of the things that is interesting when we look at the Four Noble Truths and we look at Buddhism, everyone uh, you know, comes to Buddhism trying to get control of their life with the idea, I'm going to go and I'm going to reach Nirvana. And it is possible to reach Nirvana in this lifetime. We know this is true. This is the gift the Buddha gave us, and he did give us this path. But not everyone is going to take the time to do that in this lifetime. And for those who don't have the time to put in a full time for the meditation, then what happens to them? So we have a difference between where I start and where I reach Nibbana and what is in between. Well, I would say that there is a great reduction of suffering that is possible to happen if we understand the teachings clearly enough and we can apply these into our life, then we can have all different degrees of the reduction of suffering on the way, on the journey to reaching Nibbana. There is one sutta that is in the Samyutta Nikaya that we call it a, uh, a developmental chart that the Buddha left us. It's called the Upanisa Sutta. In English, they call it this proximate cause. And it's found in the, um, uh, the Samyutta Nikaya. And if this is in Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation of the Samyutta Nikaya. It's in the section for the Book of Causation, the Nidana Waga, that you will find that. It's a small sutta. But the interesting part is what happens on this pattern that shows you a developmental line that comes and uh, shows you exactly what happens to a person when they are developing their meditation. And actually what happens on this is the person is suffering. They come and put faith in the teaching of the Buddha. And then what happens is they start to practice the mindfulness meditation and get relief. At that point, they experience joy. When the joy fades away, they experience tranquility. When the tranquility fades away, they experience happiness. And then they experience collectedness. And then after that, they go back and continue to meditate, and they realize the knowledge and vision of how things work. And then at that point, something interesting happens. They become disenchanted with a lot of things they did in the world, and they spend a lot more time with their meditation. And so they're meditating more until they get into a state of dispassion, 
And with the dispassion, they move with this dispassionate mind. They move into experiencing cessation, experiencing the Nibbana, and the total liberation, which is called the Vimuddhi. And eventually, they can accomplish the path fruit and seal this progress. How we can develop step by step as we progress and he gave us information about uh, what the good progress was and what the poor progress was in, uh, in the Digi Nikaya and told us about that also. But let's stick with, the, stick with the Four Noble Truths for right now. So what he was doing was he was personally using a pattern of investigation where he would ask the question of what is this that I'm investigating? What is the cause of this? How does the cessation of this happen? And then, how do I reach the cessation of this? And this, you can see, he was studying this aging and death, the sorrow, the lamentation, the pain, the grief and despair. He discovered birth, and before that, he discovered that the clinging, uh, the, cl the, the clinging and the uh, uh, habitual tendency of bawa was causing this birth to happen, and that the craving was causing the clinging to happen, and so forth, backwards like that. So this is how he did his investigation. So we can actually follow the pattern of the Buddha's investigation. When we do our practice and we're investigating something. So that's the second way that we can look at the mo Four Noble Truths. The third way that we can look at the, uh, at the Four Noble Truths is we can uh, examine how the Buddha was actually teaching in the texts. And when we study this, these discourses, if we listen very carefully, we're going to see that we can find the Four Noble Truths or at least three of the Four Noble Truths in each one of the discourses. And this was very interesting to me that he was able to follow this pattern of teaching very, very specifically. He was able to uh, take us into saying, uh, this is the subject that we're going to discuss, and let's look at the cause of this subject, what's happening, what's the problem, and I'm going to explain to you now the solution of the answer uh, to that problem. And then I'm going to show you the path where you can have the answer all the time. So he was doing this, for instance, he was using this in one of the famous suttas that we, um, that we have um, talked about, I think, a couple of times before, where uh, what people usually, in the text, what happens is a character will show up and he will question the Buddha on a particular thing. And in this particular sutta, the Ganaka Moggallana Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya, the Ganaka Moggallana, he shows up and he is going to ask questions of the Buddha about certain things. He is going to uh, uh, ask the teacher, ask the Buddha how exactly he's training the monks. And he asks him several questions. He'll say, for instance, in the beginning, uh, he'll say, do you have a gradual practice, a gradual training, a gradual practice, and gradual progress? Down to the last step, can you show me how to do this? And it's interesting because the Buddha tells Ganaka Mokalana, he says, uh, it is possible, and I do have this gradual training uh, that is a step-by-step -step thing. It is possible for me to show you the gradual training, the gradual practice, and the gradual progress in the Dhamma and in the discipline. And he says, just as uh, a clever horse trainer obtains a fine thoroughbred colt, he first makes him get used to wearing the bit, and afterwards he trains him further. So it is also true when the Tathagata, the Buddha, obtains a person to be tamed, he first disciplines him and says, you should learn the virtue, restrained, uh, become restrained by the precepts, and if you are a monk, by the padimoka, which are the rules for the monk, and you should become perfect in conduct and in resort, 
and seeing fear in the slightest fault, the training for this uh, monk will proceed and he will undertake the training precepts. And then when that monk is completely trained in that sense, he then starts to teach him another layer of the practice. And the Buddha talks about the different layers of practice which he should learn step by step. And so it's true that the Buddha had a gradual training, a gradual practice, and a gradual progress that was laid out very clearly. And in the Bhupanisa Sutta, we can see proof that there was a developmental chart for the person to actually make a picture of and see for themselves about where they were as they were progressing along. Now, one of the things in this sutta that is very um, precious to us is that the Buddha made it clear that if you follow the instructions, you will reach the end of the, uh, the road. You will get to the destination. But if you don't follow the instructions, you will not end up at the destination. And he says a, a little uh, simile to the Brahmin. And uh, he's, the Brahmin asks him, he says, uh, do all of the monks always attain Nibbana? Or do some of the monks not obtain Nibbana? So this is the question that's asked to the Buddha. He says, since Nibbana exists and the path leading to Nibbana exists, and Master Gotama is present as the guide, what is the cause or the reason why some of the disciples are advised and instructed by him, and some of them attain Nibbana, the ultimate goal, and some do not attain it. And then he tells him very clearly, as to that, I will ask you a question in return, and you can answer it as ever you choose. What do you think? Are you familiar with the road that's leading to Rajagaha? He asks him that. And yes, Master Gotama, I am familiar with the road leading to Rajagaha. Well, what do you think? Suppose a man came who wanted to go to Rajagaha, and he approached you and he said, Venerable Sir, I want to go to Rajagaha. Show me the road to Rajagaha. And then you told him, Now, good man, this road to gra goes to Rajagaha, and you pointed the way. Follow it for a while, and you will see a certain village. And go a little further, and you will see a little town. And go a little further, and you will see Rajagaha with its lovely parks and its groves, its meadows and its ponds. And then, having been thus advised and instructed by you, he would take a wrong road, and he would go to the west. And then a second man came who wanted to go to Rajagaha, and he approached you and he said, Venerable Sir, I want to go to Rajagaha. And then you told him exactly the same thing. And if you follow it, you will see that Rajagaha is there with its lovely parks and groves and meadows and ponds. And then having thus advised that man and been instructed by you, he would arrive safely in Rajagaha. Now, Brahman, since Rajagaha exists and the path leading to Rajagaha exists and you are present as the guide, what is the cause and the reason why when those men have both been instructed and advised by you, one man takes a wrong road and goes to the west and the other man reaches Rajagaha? It's because he didn't follow the instructions. So we have this, uh, the instructions laid out for us. And in the teaching, the Buddha explains through the use of the Four Noble Truths, step by step, each one of these discourses. And in this one, we see the man came with the aging with the question. And he asked for the cause. And the Buddha gave him the clear definition of the cause and explained to him why some people will reach Rajagaha and some people will not. 
So the instructions were very clear. It wasn't a case where we could simply mix everything together and say that it was going to work. So this third way of looking at the Four Noble Truths is the pattern that the Buddha used in teaching. Now the fourth one and the last one, uh, a way of looking at the Four Noble Truths, and there probably maybe there is another way, but I don't know it right now. <laughs> but the, for the lay person, the most useful thing I wish I had when I was raising my children uh, is this fourth way. The Four Noble Truths can be used as what's called a four-step solution. So as a family, people can sit down and they can use the Four Noble Truths in everyday life. It's a form of conflict resolution that is very friendly, that anyone can use. And four people can sit around the table, or as many people as involved, and we can ask the people, what do you think the problem is? What do you think the problem is? What do you think the problem is? What do each of you think the problem is? And we write it down. What do you think the cause of this problem or this challenge is? What do you think uh, the solution to this problem or this challenge is? When we have everyone's idea of what we think the problem, the solution, and the path to the solution is, we can look at the four noble truths and, I'm sorry, at the Eightfold Path and use it as a guideline, use it as a guidance system to carry out the solution to whatever the issue is in our home life. We can do this not only at home, we can use this in the office structure, we can use this in the business structure. I know that I had a business for 14 years and several of the companies that I worked with as a personnel consultant were interested in conflict resolution and in arbitration within the company for people who were having difficulties in, in any number of different ways. And they paid a lot of money to learn how to do what the Buddha taught us we could do. You can take this structure into your office, take the structure into government, take it into the Senate, take it into the uh, population, and use it as a format in order to govern, in order to operate a business, and in order to run a family. So this is a really good structure of using all four of the noble truths. There is suffering. There is a cause of suffering. There is a, a cessation of suffering. And there is a path to the cessation of suffering. So we have this wonderful format that's been given to us with the Four Noble Truths. And I'm going to leave you now. And I am hoping that I will be back shortly and we'll be doing another topic for you to listen to.